Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon, this evening, wh whenever you're, you're plugging into this virtual Q&A. Very excited. My name is Ben Fowley. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of the Point North Institute and the founder of the Camden International Film Festival. If you're watching this Q&A, you probably already know that. Uh, but I want to welcome you all to CISLEX Plus virtual Q&A around the incredible film, The Painter and the Thief. Very lucky to have director Benjamin Ree here, as well as artist collaborator Barbara Krasilkoval, uh, calling us all the way from, from Norway. Uh, so welcome, and thank you both for joining us. Thank you very much for having us. And congratulations. Um, I, I, I was lucky enough to see this film at Sundance, unfortunately at a P&I screening, which meant I did not get a chance to uh, hear you both uh, talk about the work, uh, but was absolutely blown away by the film there. I, I, I was able to rewatch it again, uh, which I was grateful for the opportunity to because there's so much to dig into. But I just want to you know, start by saying congratulations. This is an incredible film, incredible collaboration. And uh, again, really honored to be able to share with our audiences. Thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> well, how was the Sundance experience? Both of you were there. We can start off with a fun, easy question. Did you, was it was uh, as a filmmaker? That's kind of like the uh, uh, the pinnacle of, of sorts to be to be recognized, especially a filmmaker uh, as early or as young as you are. So, tell me a little bit about that experience for you. It was a, a fantastic experience, and I, I so much enjoyed uh, seeing Barbara being recognized all over Park City. <laughs> People wanting photos and autographs. Uh, that was uh, one of the highlights of the, of the trip. And um, un unfortunately, uh, the thief called back couldn't come because of his criminal background. But after every screening at Sundance, I had a message for the audience. Uh, uh, which was um, Carl Bertil couldn't be here today, uh, unfortunately. But uh, uh, he would like you to know that he's, he's single and he has bigger muscles now than you can see in the film. He has some new face tattoos and you can find him on Instagram under the name Bertilizer. <laughs> he has a few additional tattoos, right? I was going to ask him about that if he was able to join us today. I, 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 I did stumble across his Instagram earlier this morning and was pretty impressed by the... Uh, the amount of uh, he, he's, got some, he's got some new new to face tattoos. Yeah. So, so he sends his regards. He uh, has just finished his exam yesterday and is working out and is a bit exhausted with all the press. So he had uh, a lot of press and his final exam. So he's uh, he's uh, taking some time off now, but he sends his regards. Great. Uh, and Barbara, I'd love to just hear your, your experience. Obviously, you, you know, you strike me as somebody that likes to have some 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 privacy, and 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 and, and that that seems to kind of uh, really come through in your work. Tell me a little bit about being on, in Park City during a uh, a carnival like Sundance. Yeah, you you described me pretty well. But I'm glad that Benjamin said uh, the things he said about me, so that I don't have to brag myself uh, <laughs> about myself. <laughs> Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, well, it, it was, first of all, it was my very first film festival ever, um, as, both as a, as a spectator and as a, or as a visitor and as then some sort of part of the, the film, uh, films being shown. And yes, it's, it's totally insane when you step out of your bubble, as I like to call my atelier, you step outside of your bubble where you basically are day by day alone, just with you, yourself and your paintings. And suddenly you walk on the street and you're each second meter approached by people who want to hug you, who want to express their gratitude and their emotions and share their stories. So it was a little bit uh, insane. I, I kind of call it like it was a nice one week of a circus for me. It was a nice show off. But then I was just so happy to return back to my bubble. <laughs> yeah, bubbles are very nice, especially, uh, especially when, you, when you're excited to get back to them. Um, so let's get into the, 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 the reason why we're here, which is to unpack this incredible, incredibly complex and beautiful story. Uh, and I, I just want to start because it's always easier to, to understand, um, you know, when we have this question kind of out, out, uh, out of the forefront, which is Benjamin as a director, you know, there's a lot of incredible stories out there. I think this is one that you probably didn't know the twist and turns when you jumped into it, but how did you come across it? And what was, uh, you know, what kind of flashed in your brains in terms of this is something that I need to really commit three, four, five years of my life to? 
I actually began researching art robberies, uh, and uh, I found that I find that very fascinating because you had the high culture art and low culture ro robbers, and at that time it was on the front. This story was on the front newspapers in Norway. So I followed the case and I contacted Barbara after the trial. Uh, and when I met Barbara, it was very early in the process of uh, her getting to know Kalbake. So they had met about four times. Uh, the footage you see before that is filmed uh, by a friend of Barbara, uh, the most of it, that uh, had kind of documented uh, Barbara. So it was just amazing to begin a project where so much was already filmed. Uh, but I actually, uh, I, I thought the setup of the story was very intriguing with uh, Barbara approaching uh, the thief in court and asking if she could paint him. And we were lucky to also have the audio recording for, from their first meeting. Uh, and that was the setup of the story. That was the kind of the hook of the story. But I was planning to do a short documentary, like 10 minutes documentary. So I knew nothing about where the story might end up. And uh, I, I usually work at the uh, um, online newspaper where I make short documentaries. Uh, and I tend to like begin five to 10 projects at the same time. Uh, and many of them are like the pres uh, present tense story where we take kind of uh, filmmaking. So I don't know where the stories might end up. Uh, but very quickly, I understood that this is a great story because we have two very, very fascinating uh, subjects with their uh, emotions on the outside. Uh, so when Carl Bakil saw himself painted for the first time in the film, uh, th that's, the, that's a moment when I realized that this is something bigger than a web TV 10 minutes documentary. Uh, and then the project just, just grew and I kept on filming for three years. But it's, uh, uh, I did not know like all the twists and turns and the surprising, surprising things that would happen. But again, I also like that like, when, when I begin like five or 10 projects, like short documentaries, some of them will most likely turn up to be bigger projects. But uh, uh, this project with the painter and the thief uh, just went insane. <laughs> there are so many surprising moments and turning points in the story. So I could uh, not have uh, dreamed of a, of a kind of a better story than also having Barbara finding her missing painting towards the end. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a second because I have a, a, certainly a question around that. And I, I really appreciate you bringing up that scene, uh, the initial scene. Roberto sees himself, uh, uh, you know, on canvas, and, and what a profound moment! I think, for me, that was the, the 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 really, in some ways, the start of of the the really complex journey that that the film kind of goes into because you were starting the film with the the crime, and then you're then you're really realizing that the the vulnerabilities and the emotions that that you and uh, Barbara and, and Bertolt are, are, are going to share with, with the audiences over the, the next hour and 25 minutes or so. It's a really profound moment, I think, and, and well executed in terms of the timing of when you lay it out. Um, so Barbara, you, you know, you're, you're this kind of quiet painter, you know, you're, 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 your prestige and recognition is growing and then this happens and um, you seemingly, you know, start to, to get intrigued by the story yourself, but then you have this kind of shaggy bearded uh, filmmaker come approach you and says, hey, I want to do on you. What is your initial reaction? And then you were initially like, no, no. How long did it take you to, uh, to kind of uh, have Benjamin win you over? Well, uh, I have to say about Benjamin, don't be fooled by his uh, visage. I mean, he looks like this nice young man, you know, with the, with the glasses. <laughs> he did not have the beard at that time. So there was this kind of... A4 man coming, but he's bigger geek than me and Bertil together. He's such a weirdo. And I mean, it was a compliment, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the, the word shaggy. I was thinking about uh, the, the musician, but it's probably another word. <laughs> <laughs> So were you instantly like on board in, in terms of being not only, a, you know, I hate this word, sub, you know, a subject, but also a collaborator. I, I think of you as, you know, like you were clearly helping to direct some of the action in the film. So tell oh, me. No, 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 not at all. 
<clears throat> not in the sense of like your interest in exploring, you know, continuing to explore the, the mystery around the painting that was involved. That was part of the, you know, how the film unravels, meaning how were you initially comfortable putting yourself in the middle of, of, of a story that you didn't quite know where it was going? Um, me, myself, I really had nothing to hide. Uh, so for me, it was much more concern about Bertil, not that he would have things to hide, but the thing he put at stake on this film to really explore himself, uh, not explore, sorry, expose himself to peel off all his layers, that was much more of a question whether uh, he would have the guts to do it. Uh, I'm super glad and thankful to him that he decided to, to do it. Uh, for me, you know, as I said once more, I mean, I'm, I'm actually quite boring character. I just stand or sit in my atelier and paint, you know. Sometimes I, I kind of try to find out what to eat, uh, where to get my tobacco, which I can't get in Norway, which is a really, really difficult situation then. But so for me, it's not really much to, to put at stake. Mm -hmm. It was not. And I mean, uh, I would definitely search or try to find out something more about my missing paintings because I soon understood the police in Norway is as passive as police in my home country would be in Czechia. So I knew I had to take it somehow in my own hands. Uh, but this also was quite a secondary uh, thing for me. I really was and am more after to get to know Bertil and to see what lays under all these layers and to maybe be there when he rebuilds himself into the man as he is today. Mm. And I, I don't agree with you that you are a boring character, would I? <laughs> I find you very complex and fascinating. <laughs> I'm still just learning how to brag about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just this is kind of a continuation of what you were you were mentioning there, but we you know obviously there was some some the the the, the footage pro, you know in the courtroom it sounds like that was that was kind of pre-recorded uh, not pre -recorded, that was recorded before you got involved in the project is that correct Benjamin right that's correct uh, it's uh, Barbara who had the recorder in uh, with, yeah. with her. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, so I, I wonder, Barbara, for you, um, so much of this film, it, this is really about kind of exposing and sharing vulnerability in many ways, and, and the relationship you had with Bertolt prior to this film becoming what it is. Can you talk a little bit about that, just in terms of like how long you had been communicating with him, and um, more importantly, did that change at all when Benjamin entered the picture? You know, in terms of really having an, uh, a third person with a camera involved in the in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just first want to clarify why there is this audio recording from the courtroom. And that I actually was encouraged by my boyfriend, Oystein, to do that. Uh, so I kind of broke the law because I realized this was not quite legal to do. But since my Norwegian back then was uh, as poor as it is today, so I wanted to have the full recording so that then Oysten can help me to translate it more precisely. So that's the reason why I had uh, the sound recorder hidden there with me. And back to your question then. Um, well, first of all, I have to say that not at all of being experienced subject for a documentary filmmaker from ever before, but I have to admit that both Benjamin and the photographer, Christopher Kumar, who also was there often a lot uh, filming, they both are such amazingly sensitive people uh, who really suddenly disappear from the room when they are there with the camera. So it, most of the time I really was not aware that there is some third person with the camera around. I really was not. Also for the reason maybe that sometimes the actual situation with Bertil when he was in his lower moment of life uh, was probably just way too big to take anything else into my own uh, you know perspective like I just could only see the thing of Bertil so there was no more space in my mind for noticing anything else around and how did this project uh, or how it might be influencing me and Bertil our friendship uh, well, I hope if it influences it, then only in its best. I mean, of course, this is, as I have already answered in one interview, like friendship for me is a very, very big responsibility, mutual responsibility. 
Um, and I really believe that we both signed up for it voluntarily and we just have to look after each other now. Uh, this is a question for both of you, and I, it, it's another continuation, because uh, I agree with Benjamin and, and disagree with you, Barbara, about you being a, a boring character. I think some of the some of the real complexity of the film is really kind of unravel when it when when it kind of shifts to you and examining, um, you know, you your 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 past, how it connects to your work. I think your your partner has some really really interesting, powerful scenes um, in the film. But I would I want to. Um, the question I think is is more about you know the the rawness that 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 was captured um, uh, and, and the way you exposed yourself, Barbara, in, in some of these through some some of these darker chapters that were discussed. Um, did you ever feel like the film was getting too intimate for you personally? Um, and um, on that end, Benjamin, how were you looking at you know when you had the the kind of core arc of the story and you had uh, Bertolt as the character, w were you as the filmmaker trying trying to find ways to shift into um, exposing a bit more of, of, of Barbara's past and, and how that is influencing her relationship with, with Bertolt? Um, talk about that as a director and, and some of the, the choices you made. So for me, um, probably what also influenced my uh, feeling about whether I expose myself a lot or how do I feel about it. I can't really step outside of comparing me with Bertil, what Bertil actually allowed to expose or allowed the camera to capture. So I felt like it would be absolutely unfair if I were trying to hide something. So I just tried to be, or let's say I removed my possible filters or trying to, to, to pose somehow in front of the camera, which I did not even notice there. But no, I, I just felt it would be highly unfair to Bertil if I tried to hide some of my darker sides. And plus, uh, I also believe, I guess you might be talking maybe about the, the chapter or the part where we get to know about my previous relationship. So also in the second thought that happened afterwards, I was uh, actually okay with that this also sounds or comes into the film because I believe maybe some people, both men and women, might be at the moment in some sort of unpleasant or violent relationship. And I believe to, to see somebody who is having this past and is, after, is having this over done, it might also encourage these people to maybe make some choices. So, yeah. Thank you. So, um, one of the goals of this film uh, has been to uh, explore a lot of dimensions to Barbara and Carl Bertil. And I think that if we only would focus on Bertil's uh, problems, it would be a sort of a cliche. You have the muse and an artist, and you like follow it from only the, uh, the, the artist's perspective. That what you usually see. And the, the, the artist is then often a male. So I wanted to make a Barbara and Karl Bertil more even in a way. So if it, if it was only Karl Bertil that had a lot of problems, it would make it a bit uneven. And I think it, uh, I think Barbara deserves to be explored in a complex way. Uh, I think that was important for the film and story, but I think it's important to, uh, to really let the audience uh, get a chance to uh, know the many dimensions of Barbara. And that is what kind of storytelling I like. I like to read books and watch films and really feel like I get to know these the people I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reading and, and, and watching. Uh, so I try to add as many dimensions I could to the reduction uh, of their lives because a film is a reduction. But when you reduce it, it's, it's my goal to, to have as much complexity there as possible. And um, uh, I also wanted to explore, like this was uh, something I was very curious about from the first moment I began filming, was I really saw that Bible and Carl Bakil had uh, a great connection, a chemistry. 
Uh, and I really couldn't understand why. So that was a driving motor. And maybe I still don't understand uh, why. Uh, but I think that that curiosity made it possible for me to work with this project for over three years. And uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I think it's, I, I don't like to kind of reduce the film to one sentence or a moral a moral sentence or something like that. But uh, one thing I found uh, was, of course, that they were very much alike. I, I began this project with uh, with being fascinated by contrast, you know, a painter and a thief. And towards the end of filming, I, I realized that uh, they were very much alike. Uh, but more, I don't want to kind of try to reduce it or interpret it more than that, because I, I don't think I really know. Uh, and I think it's... A film that tries to ask more, ask more questions than than find the answers uh, to them. Mm. Well, that's really well said, both of you. I, I I would just add, I think Barbara, the way your your approach or your willingness to you know collaborate in this project in the way that you did, uh, um, I think is you know what makes an, an incredible film an incredible story, just really powerful in in, in many ways. So. Um, uh, you know, it's the stuff that uh, when, when you when you're watching a lot of films or when you're making a lot of films is kind of it's electric and you can feel it. It feels alive in a way that um, you know a, a lot of a lot of films just don't. So uh, it was it was really uh, special to be able to have have that time and and feel feel like we we get to know get to know you in some way. Um, Benjamin, uh, you know, on that note, I wonder because uh, there is this great scene with with your your partner who dips in and out, and I, I saw him uh, helping out earlier on in Zoom, and I wanted to say hi. But you know, where he's talking about is, you know, are you are, uh, the, the ethical questions about the work that you do and how you, you know, um, kind of um, uh, uh, with, with people sometimes not at their 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 at their best, so to speak. Um, Benjamin, when you were filming at that time, was there anything in your mind that was saying, okay, what are the ethical questions I have as a filmmaker in terms of, um, you know, be, being in this, the same situation? Obviously, there are some scenes with, with, um, with Berto where he's, you know, struggling. And um, did, did, you, did you have those questions or do you think the relationship you all were forming um, was, was, was strong enough to, to, to really be able to, and at a time you were committing to the project, strong enough to overcome those those, those those challenges or questions i have those questions all the time and i think that's why i included that into the film i think i mirror myself in barbara in that scene and uh, it's a really good question because it's also a way to uh the, the film has a meta perspective here because we, we tell it from two perspectives and jumping back and forth in time and that makes that that makes the audience uh, they have to think about that there's a filmmaker here, so uh, it's me watching Barbara watching Bakil and Bakil watching Barbara, uh, and uh, the scene with Barbara and the hand, of course, that's uh, something I've felt a lot during the filming of of, of this film, and it's uh, probably the biggest, the most kind of profound dilemma for a documentary filmmaker, and it's. Um, um, kind of the, the most important thing thing for all stories is drama and people struggling and uh, how they deal with the, their struggles. And to be there with the camera and film it, it's uh, it's a huge responsibility. And uh, I, I hope that I both kind of how we use the camera here. It's also an artistic choice, but also an ethical choice, how we observe Barbara and Karl uh, The same with dramaturgy, how you tell the story. I really, like, it's an artistical choice, but it's also an ethical choice. And I hope that it comes across that um, these choices um, and the way we see Barbara and Karl is done with a lot of empathy and respect. Although we see a lot of tough scenes, uh, but again, like the, take for example the scene with Carl Bakdiel uh, going to rehab and buying drugs. That's probably one of the most um, um, 
the most t toughest scene I filmed uh, over the three year period. Before that, it was called Bakil that contacted me and said, I'm going to rehab, you have to film this. Uh, and uh, we talked a lot about that we wanted to show um, how drugs affect you and show it in, a, in a, the, the ugly truth. Often you see uh, drugs being portrayed a bit glorified, a bit cool. We wanted to show what happens after the party. Uh, so after I filmed back to them begging for heroin in front of the rehab place, the day after he called me and asked, you can't use this in the film, Benjamin. It's too personal. And I said, I respect that, but I will not use it in the film. The next day after that again, he called me back and said, you have to use it in the film, Benjamin. This really shows how fucked up drugs are like how, how it can fuck you up and how dangerous it is and he really wanted people to see that uh, so that we have all these discussions all the time but it's always a dilemma when i'm filming it shall i interfere <laughs> shall i give the person a hug stop filming or shall i continue filming most of the time i just continued filming because I feel like that's my job to be there and, and observe and then afterwards we can have a lot of ethical decisions what to include and not and I feel like how we use the camera, uh, how we tell the story is artistic choices but most of all it's ethical choices in a documentary <clears throat> um, Similarly, I, I think um, one of the things I, I really love about this film is the the uh, how you I think Benjamin in many ways kind of excavated the idea of interpretation and, and examining how other people see us and how this influences the way we see ourselves. Um, I'm sure Barbara, you've seen this film many times now. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know any lessons you learned about yourself through this process um, as someone who is who is you know deeply involved in the story? I have seen the movie only one and a half times. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess uh, for somebody who has been so present in the whole process and uh, somebody with such subjective perspective as I have, I believe this one and a half times was enough to, um, to allow some uh, inner reflections. I have to admit that for me, what was highly moving uh, in the film or seeing it was of course, you know, the scenes with me, I do have total fresh memory of the emotions. I mean, I can totally be back in that situation here and now when I see it. But uh, to watch the scenes where we only see Bertil without me, these were for me, of course, new. This was for me new experience. And at this one scene where uh, we both talk about the other, when then it's Bertil's turn to talk about me, and saying that I know that she sees me, but does she know that I see her too? That was for me a very unexpectedly emotional moment. And there then I understood like, of course, of course, it's not only me observing him, it's he also observing me, even if there were a lot of, let's say, focus on him. As I said earlier, friendship is a, is a mutual um, band, bond, it's a, it's a mutual contract of responsibility uh, and for uh, let's say at the beginning of our friendship it was I thought quite a lot about Bertel because he was really going through insane struggles but even though it was in my feeling so much about him I actually then understood seeing this scene that there still was a space in him for me as well and that was for me really really very emotional uh, moment I'm going to um, turn it to you, Benjamin, uh, as, a, as, an, as an additional observer and somebody who I think, I'm assuming has seen it more than like, one and a half times. Uh, <laughs> oh, I've seen it one and a half times, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I've uh, seen it so many times that I could uh, quote every quote from the film. <laughs> <laughs> like, do, do, you have, do you have one hour and uh, 30, 42 <laughs> minutes? <laughs> um, what about you? Uh, what have you learned about yourself as you kind of... Um, been able to construct the story, deconstruct it, construct it again, and then have some separation from it. Has there anything that, ha that you have kind of learned about yourself through the process? 
Uh, I've learned a lot about myself uh, during the process, and um, uh, I think that uh, one thing I, I've got a very deep understanding of uh, why people take drugs because when you uh, suffer uh, from depression and anxiety, I can totally understand it. I can totally understand why that's an easy solution. And it's so difficult to get off drugs and sober up. And Bakil, he has been sober now for over a year. And he's studying. Uh, but if you look at the film from the point that um, Bakil is at his lowest point, lowest point, um, I don't think you can get any lower than that. Like 16 broken bones in your body, almost died, um, really lucky to survive. And then uh, being a heroin addict at the top of that and suffering from depression and anxiety. And from that point on, building yourself up gradually and getting where back is today, I think that is the most impressive thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, and I'm uh, so proud uh, of Bakil that he, he managed to do that. Uh, it's, it's difficult to imagine how much work it takes to, to, to change your life in that way. And, and that has inspired me enormously. And I, I hope that that can also inspire uh, others as well. Mm. It's well said. I, you know, um, I, like I said, we, uh, my organization is based in Maine. We have uh, a, a very serious problem with the opioid epidemic that is that is certainly sweeping um, much of the country and, and certainly a lot of rural communities. And we work a lot with the state on trying to reduce the stigma around um, addiction. And and I think in many ways. There's so much I wanted to talk about with 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 about Norway and the and the prison systems and the things that seemingly you were doing right about really approaching this as a as a, as a humanitarian effort and not a as a um, incarceration effort effort like we do here in the states. But that'll be another conversation. But I think uh, I, I appreciate you touching on that because it definitely was something that uh, resonated with me and and uh, it was really beautiful to go be able to go on to his Instagram and see that, um, you know, there's some real, real beautiful progress being made there. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope, I hope for him, the film was, was, was trans as transformative as it seemed to come across to audiences for him and for all of you. I think it was uh, really, really tough for Bakel uh, to, to see the film. Um, and he actually described it as horrible to watch it the first time. Um, but one of Bakil's biggest motivation has been exactly what you're saying now. He says that uh, I hope that this film can remove some stigmas from society, uh, that you people can see that you can uh, be a s smart and nice uh, person, even if you have some trouble. I think I quoted him correctly there. <laughs> uh, and um, I think it's a very, very brave of him uh, to share his story in this way, although it's very painful for him. Of course it is. Uh, it's painful for, for him to watch. But he's also proud. It shows that um, it's, it, it, it's possible to change. It's possible to sober up. And I think that gives a lot of hope. If I may step here a uh, little bit with what you asked Benjamin before and or what Benjamin spoke about Bertil's journey upwards. Of course, I also totally subscribe to the biggest respect to Bertil, how he managed himself to put himself back on the feet. And what then you mentioned about this whole drug issue, and uh, as we dare to call it, the problem. For me, this was also quite a starting point of curiosity because, and I don't want to be too moralistic here, but hell, it's too easy to condemn and to, to put on the side into the shadow the, the things we don't want to see and to say that all junkies are bad. But it's as opposite as, as, as it sounds, you know. And as I started to get to know Bertil, I also wanted to understand it a bit more of the addiction as such. And what helped me a lot there was one ingenious uh, uh, doctor, uh, born in Hungary now, I think he lives in Vancouver, his name is Gabor Mate. 
he's been working for decades and decades with uh, drug users and uh, many forms of addictions. And there I got totally confirmed that these people need to be embraced much more than anything else. And I dare to say it worked out with Bertil. But you can see it unfolding with your relationship. I mean, you really can. And, and that's, um, I think, as you, it kind of ties into what you brought up twice now, the, the idea of a friendship is, is, you know, it's a bond and it's a commitment and it's a responsibility. And I think right. that is, that is what, you, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, right? I think approaching, approaching right. it, you have um, generally yields the best results. And um he's a he's a he's a uh, an example of that we can point to and say um you know there 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 are positive other sides that we can reach if we work together yeah and it's also like even though bertil was at his lowest i still saw through through this darkness and desperation that there inside of him is this amazingly funny and highly intelligent person like for example if i may just name one situation he came over to my atelier once, uh, not in good shape, just being really feeling down. So he just sort of collapsed on my sofa at the studio and I asked him, what can I do for you? And he answered, just play some Schubert, please. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. sure, that's Bertil, you know? So yeah. you, have to, you have to be curious about this guy. You know? and, al <laughs> and also after the car accident when, uh, uh, he has uh, kind of a lot of screws inside his body and he, he uh, went to Instagram and, uh, and wrote, it feels like I got, just got screwed or something. My hips don't lie with the pop culture Shakira reference also there. So I thought it's, his dark sense of humor is just uh, so funny. Yeah, I mean, when uh, the, when you're initially reading the letter for the first time, I remember I, when I first saw the film, I was just like, I was waiting with this anticipation to kind of like hear him through his words because I, you know, you can, even at that point, we hadn't really spent much time with him on screen, right? But we knew, or I knew it, you could feel that there is so much there, so much intelligence, so much, so much passion, so much um, that you, you wanted to get there, you know? And um, so, you know, it, it, I think it comes, I think you can feel it, uh, certainly. Um, and please, please give him our best. Um, tell him I say hello, and uh, uh, maybe I'll email some questions to you guys. You can pass them along. But, um, congratulations to you both, uh, Benjamin and Barbara. Thank you for joining. Um, your work is incredible. Um, and I'd love, uh, if you're ever in the, the States, to please let us know, and we'll come down and um, bring some of my, my friends who, uh, who love art. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm definitely planning to get my canvases across the ocean to US. I'm working on it, so you will know about it. Excellent. Excellent. And Benjamin, please keep us updated. Uh, anything we can do to help promote the film. You're in good hands with Neon, obviously, but uh, <laughs> you know, um, good luck with the, the rollout. And please keep us updated on any, any new projects you have in the works. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.